Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John. And uh, so, good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, spend the next 20 minutes or so just talking to you about how we actually sell the airplanes. What are the what are the parameters that the airlines look at, and why is it through the comfort, through the efficiency, and the profitability, through our products, we're able to get the uh, the, the, the high percentage in terms of market share. So let's start, first of all, with the family. Because when airlines buy the aircraft, most airlines actually don't just buy a single aircraft, of course some of them do, but the majority of airlines will spend their time looking at various different types of Airbus airplanes or Boeing airplanes, and they'll go through the family of aircraft that we have to offer. So the family concept is extremely important, not just from the commonality point of view, but from the branding point of view, from the image of the airline, from their ability to serve various markets, the family of aircraft, that, whether it's Airbus, Boeing, or even Bombardier has to offer, uh, is an extremely important part of their choice. As you can see, and as you know, we have a, a very uh, very family of aircraft, ranging from the 320 family, with uh, right up to the A380, with 600 seats plus in the A380. Now, when we compare that with what we have to compete against with the Boeing family, what we see, of course, is that they also have a family, but when we look at their family, of course, the 747-8 today is more or less finished. The 737-7, according to Boeing themselves, is more or less finished. So that leaves them with a very small family of aircraft to compete with a very uh, large family of aircraft from the Airbus uh, stables. So the first part when we're out there competing is that we have a much wider selection of aircraft for the airlines to choose from. As John said, when we look at an airline, what, are they, what is the airline actually, so we have a lot of science, we have a lot of technology in this business, but actually what is it that the airlines actually look at when they're trying to select an aircraft, whether it's Airbus or Boeing? Well, of course, comfort. And why do they look at comfort? Because they're going to put us as passengers in, in those cabins. They want to create a brand. So they want to have a, a canvas from which they can create uh, the, the, the best brand that they can offer to their customers, the traveling public. So comfort is extremely important to them. The cabin ambience is extremely important to the airlines. And this is where one of the areas where we compete very strongly against our competitors. And I'll go through each family of airplane to show how each one of these parameters is, is, is competing one against the other. Efficiency, of course. Efficiency comes in fuel, it comes in maintenance costs, it comes in the ability to uh, to deliver the airlines a very, very low operating cost per seat. But efficiency on its own doesn't deliver profitability. And to have profitability, you have to have range capability, you have to have the right numbers of seats, you have to have the ability to take off from various airports in difficult conditions. So all that put together makes the ability for the airlines to choose from one aircraft type to the other aircraft type. So now let's go through the family of airplanes and see how we compete on each one of those parameters going forward. Well, let's start with the 320. And here you can see the lineup between the 320 and the 737. We'll stick to the NEO because that's where the competitions are today. And we look at the NEO against the MAX. So as we've heard from Boeing, yes, their 737-7 doesn't really uh, cut very much with the airlines. It's too small, it's inefficient. So they're already thinking of making a slightly bigger 737. Our 319, it, it's, the market used to be 319s and 320s, and we sold uh, a lesser percentage in terms of 321s, but as time has gone by, as, as growth has, has kicked in into various markets, the middle classes have grown, the market has moved from the 319 stroke 320 up from to the 320 and 321. So then when we compare the 320 and 321 against the competitive competition from Boeing, the 737 MAX 8 and MAX 9, you can see from the percentages that are shown on this chart that actually the difference between a Dash 7 and a Dash 8 is too big. And the difference between a Dash 8 and a Dash 9 is too small. Whereas we have a very even split between the various family members, which works very well with the airlines. And it's going to admitting it themselves. And you can see today that they're trying to make the 737-7 a little bit bigger. They're trying to make the 737-9 a little bit bigger. They're trying to get to the same sort of percentages that we have. Because today they've basically got a mismatched family against the A320 family between the 19, 20, and 21. Comfort. You've seen this a lot, but it's, it's, it's something that we really have to emphasize. When you choose an airline today to fly on, as John said, a lot of people today are going into the marketplace, choosing airlines based on what they've read. Just like when you choose a hotel, you look at the trip advisor, you'll get the information as to what the airline is offering. 
Same thing is happening today with, with the airline seat, where the seat guru, there's so many websites that we have to, to look at what the airlines offering. And whether you look at an A320, an A330, an A350, or an A380, in any one of those categories, Airbus has always made the aircraft to deliver the best comfort in terms of seats. Of course, we can all make very nice first and business class cabins, but there's a vast majority of passengers flying in economy class. They need to have a, a comfort as well, and Airbus delivers that through the 18 inch seat. When you fly short haul, one of the very most important things that you have to look at, of course, is baggage space. When you go on board the aircraft, because the airline's turnaround time is key to a lot of the low-cost airlines. They have to turn the 320s around in 25 minutes. If you haven't got space for your baggage, that slows the whole process down. The reason why low-cost airlines work is because they, they put more passengers on board the aircraft, but they also turn around the aircraft very quickly, and they get the daily utilization up. That drives the economics of the aircraft. If you can't turn the airline aircraft around quickly, you destroy that model. And with the 320, with 15% larger bid space, with a wider aisle, we can get passengers on and off the aircraft very quickly. We can get the containers off in terms of the, uh, if they're carrying cargo. All of that helps to improve the turnaround time of the A320. And the baggage space, and I don't need to say it, but any of you who have flown will always know that everyone's fighting for that baggage space. So 15% more baggage space on the A320 through the larger bins that we have is a very important part in when an airline chooses between an Airbus and a Boeing. The cabin, of course, is very important. As I said, the airlines want to create a brand. Between our door one and, and the door at the back of the aircraft, it's, it's perfectly straight. On the 737, it comes in at the front, it comes into the back. Uh, they have a small door for catering. We have a bigger door for catering. We have bigger bins. We have the wider seats. We have wider aisles. All these parameters on the A320 are superior to that on the 737. That's why the 320 wins out on campaigns. So we look at the efficiency, or we look at the ability of the airline to create profit. Of course, then you come into the cost per seat of the aircraft. As John mentioned, when we looked at the old generation of CEOs against NGs, there was a little bit of a difference when positive if we looked at it, positive if Boeing looked at it. But when it comes down to the A320neo against the 737 MAX, the difference is quite large. And its reasons for that is, of course, the engine. The engine sits much higher off the ground on the A320. We have a 79-inch diameter. Everything is driven by the bypass ratio. On the 737, they have to go with this, roughly the same engine, but they have to have a 68-inch diameter on the engine. That makes a big difference to the efficiency of the engine. The way they integrate that engine into the, into the wing is also compromised on the 737. All that put together creates a bigger difference between the A320 here and the 737 MAX. That's what drives the difference in terms of efficiency. When we move across to the A321 against the 737 MAX 9, there, of course, we then have the seating capability on the A321 that also kicks in. We have all the inherent efficiency parameters that we talked about, but then you have the ability to take the A321 right up to 240 seats. And we got to 240 seats, not by making the airplane longer, but by some clever innovation uh, that was done on the airplane. But innovation is key to Airbus. Innovation is something that we do even when we have more than 50% market share. We keep driving for the aircraft to get better. You can see all the various aspects that we've looked at in, in terms of efficiency and driving efficiency through innovation over the past few years. NEO, of course, was, was the biggest one, but there are lots of other efficiency parameters that we have improved. Some of those, of course, are shown here in this picture. Space flex, where when you enter the aircraft, we were able to you can, you can see at the back of whether it's a 737 or an A320, at the rear of the aircraft, just before the doors, that's where we used to have the labs for the, uh, for the A320 and same space for the 737. Those labs have now been integrated into the rear pressure bulkhead. Uh, the galley space is adequate in terms of, it's actually more galley space even by doing that compared to a regular 737 because of their tapering fuselage that they have, their small galleys at the front, small galleys at the back. Here we have the ability to have a good-sized galley at the back, a good-sized galley at the front, and uh, the two labs integrated into the rear pressure bulkhead. That gives us 36 inches of space. So actually we've gone from 180 to 189. People say, oh, you crammed more passengers into the aircraft. No, we haven't. Because each seat is somewhere between, let's say, 29 or 30, maybe even 31-inch pitch. But we've freed up 36 inches of space, and we've put in 31 inches of seats. So actually, the additional five inches have been transferred to the rows ahead. 
So when you go into the airplane today, you get more seats into the airplane and you get more pitch as well. And that's done through a very clever innovation. Smart labs, if you still want to have the labs, if you want to have the big galley, we can give you a smart lab that uses less of a footprint on the airplane. And so again, it gives you more space for the passengers. We changed the rating on the doors. We have bigger doors than the, than the 737, yet we had a, a lower rating in terms of the evacuation limit. Why? That was just grandfather rule. So we applied the same uh, approach to the, uh, the authorities, and we got a bigger rating in terms of our evacuation ability through the A320, and that's allowed us to go up to 189, if not more, if we, if we can make it on the A320, and we can go up to 240 on the A321. Uh, Airbus Cabin Flex also was brought into the A321, where just by simple changing of door positions, we're able to take the aircraft up to 240 seats. So very simple innovation, but the innovation that's delivered real value to our customers and the airlines. So our strategy on the A320, we started, of course, with the CEO. We put the winglets on the airplane. We got 4% additional uh, fuel burn saving by putting the winglets on. We pushed the airplane into the into the new, kept the winglets. We changed the engine. That got us 15%. And then as we approach 2020, uh, we will get more efficiency through the aerodynamics of the aircraft. We get more efficiency through some weight saving. We get more efficiency through additional seats on the aircraft. We get more efficiency from the engine uh, fuel burn. So all that put together will get us a 20% fuel burn saving relative to the uh, A320 CO that we started off for. So put all of that together and when we compete against the 737, we don't have a small difference today between a 320 and a 737 MAX. We have a very significant difference and that difference only gets bigger as we go to the A321. So now we move into the, into the wide bodies. We start with the 330 and then go into the A350. So look at the direct competition. We have the A330-900 uh, competing against the 787-9, 330 against the 787-8. You saw the numbers from John. We can, on the, on the smaller aircraft, we can deliver the same uh, range. We can deliver slightly more seats. We do it with a much greater efficiency. And we do that, again, through innovation. We, we spent a lot of time on these airplanes in terms of improving them. But one thing which we didn't have to improve, because everyone loved the A330, and that is the comfort and the seating layout of the A330. Everyone loved the aircraft, of course. It came from the 1990s in terms of its look and feel, and that we will come and we have, we have addressed as well. But even though uh, the Dreamliner, was, as it was called, or as they tried to call it, it still has a 17-inch seat, because when they started off with the Dreamliner, it was an eight-abreast airplane but they very quickly realized they couldn't compete 8 abreast 787 against 8 abreast 8330. So they had to cram an extra row of seats uh, into the aircraft. They had to go to 9 abreast. They didn't do it because they just felt like it. They had to. It was a necessity in order to compete. And that's with the 330 CEO. Now when we put the 330 NEO, of course the 330 NEO is much more efficient. And I bet most of you will think, if you think of Dreamliner and the marketing messages you might get out of going, you'll think, oh, it must be quieter than a uh, current generation aircraft. Well, guess what? It's not. The A330 is much quieter than the uh, 787. Next time you're on the A330 or a 787, compare it, you'll see it. Passengers have told us, airlines have told us, we've measured it. We're about 3 dB lower on the uh, A330 cabin compared to the 787s. And as I said, the, cab the only thing that let the 330 down relative to the 787 is the cabin. So what did we do? We looked at the A350. The A350 has got a great reputation for having one of the best cabins in the sky, apart from the A380. And uh, when you put that cabin, we, we've taken features from the A350 and we've put it into the A330 Neo. So when we launch with the A330 at the end of next year, when passengers board the aircraft, they won't be able to tell the difference between an A330 Neo and an A350. Right down to the small, small detail, right down to the, the way the, the the, um, the, the, the lab is designed, the way the galleys are designed, the way the lighting is designed. All of that has been incorporated now into the A330. So when you board the aircraft, you have that family concept between an A330neo and an A350. We were so impressed, in fact, with the, the mock-ups that we made on the A330neo that we decided to launch an Airbus branding in terms of the cabin. And we call that branding Airspace.
and profitability. So when we look at the cash operating costs, we have an advantage against the 787s. But as John mentioned, it's not just the cash operating cost that's important to the airline, it's also the capital cost. And here, when you look at the two different generations of airplanes, we are able to deliver 25% lower cap capital costs for the aircraft. So how does that translate into the operating costs? This is what we call direct operating costs. You can see that the two, two and a half percent that we were talking about when we were just measuring cash operating costs, translates into a 10% saving when it comes to direct operating costs. And that eventually is what the airlines care about because that's the number that they then have to base their fares and their <coughs> profitability on. So whether it's the 787-8 or the 787-9, when it comes to cash operating costs or direct operating costs, the A330neo will be superior in, in both parameters. Again, innovation is not limited just to the A320. It's also applied to the A330. Yes, we've done the, uh, the NEO, but we've done a lot of other things to the aircraft as well. We've increased the takeoff weights of the airplanes. We've gone from, 240, from 238 tons to 242 tons. We're looking to push it further. We're looking to, uh, to make a lot of uh, changes to the airplane. And we're doing that because we, the aircraft has to stay modern, it has to stay fresh, and it has to stay ahead of the competition. And that's what gives us the lead in terms of market share. So these are just a couple of examples of the innovation that we've put into the A330. I'll, I'll look at the space flex at the back of the aircraft as, a, as one example. And when some of these airplanes, because as we said earlier, you don't need to fly 14 hours on every one of these missions. A lot of the 330s, in fact, the average A330 is flying around about 2,000 nautical miles. So when you're flying that sort of distance, you don't need all the galley space that we have in the airplane. So we have a new modular space flex galley at the back of the A330. That allows us to free up space by moving and integrating labs into the rear uh, of the aircraft again, freeing up space in the main cabin, making it more convenient for the passengers and giving, of course, the airline more seats. We've moved the crew rest from just behind the cockpit. We've moved the crew rest to just below the, uh, the, the main deck of the aircraft. That, again, frees up space. It allows us to put more galley at the front of the airplane which takes the galley out of the main part of the aircraft and again allows us to put more seats on the airplane. 
All of that is driven to increase the profitability for the airlines. So the trajectory of the strategy of the, of the A330, of course, was to go from the CEO uh, to an increased takeoff weight. We've got the 240 tons. We have an improvement from uh, our engine manufacturers to drive the fuel burn down. We had improvement from the aerodynamics to drive the fuel burn down. As we go from the NEO, from the CEO now into the NEO, of course, we get the 14% fuel burn savings. And again, we continue with continuous improvement to make even the NEO better than, than it is today. So looking now at the, the, the larger aircraft, the A350, of course, we have the single family. We have the 350-900 and 350-1000. In order to compete with our 350s in, in, the, in the future going forward, Boeing needs to have two families of airplanes. They have to have the 787s and they have to have the 777s in order to try and compete with our single family. Remember what I said earlier about commonality? Commonality plays a huge role in airline operations because they have to have uh, the crews, they have to have the cabin crews, they have to have the maintenance, they have to have the spares. Now if they need two aircraft types to compete with one aircraft type, that adds cost, it adds complexity, and it makes it very difficult for the airlines uh, to operate two aeroplane types, trying to do the same type of network as one aeroplane type, even though they come in two sizes, as far as, as the airline is concerned, it's one aircraft type. Comfort again, yes, we will all deliver beautiful products and first in business. And when it comes down to the economy class, again, Boeing used to be nine abreast in the 777s. When the 777s came out, the first few might have trickled into 10, but they very quickly came back to, to nine abreast because the passengers didn't like it. They then had to uh, look at this, to compete with the 350-1000. They looked at the 777, they made it bigger, they did all those things, but even that wasn't enough. They couldn't make the aircraft compete against the A350-1000 if they had uh, a nine abreast configuration in the 777. So they had to drive the airplane into a 10 abreast. They knew the passengers didn't like the 777 10 abreast, so they put the walls out by four inches. That still doesn't give them enough space. And then you have a nine abreast A350 against a 10 abreast 777. So let's assume that all the economics are done against 10 abreast. Let's assume that the airlines would be forced to look at a 10 abreast because the 9 simply is totally inefficient on, on the 777s. And when you do that, we still win. The cabin, you can't tell the difference between what I showed you on the A330 and what I'm showing you here on the A350. And that's what we've been done on purpose, all branded within the airspace cabin to give you the same features, the same look and feel of the aircraft as you board the airplane. You'll know you're on an Airbus airspace cabin when you board either one of these two aircraft in the future. So in the efficiency, on the left-hand side, you've got the 350-900 against the 787. On the right-hand side, you've got the 1000 against the 777-9. And it's very important to pick out the seating abreast. So as we said earlier, we have the wider seat on the 350 against the 78s, and we do that with an 18-inch seat against the 17-inch seat. 17 17-inch, if you're lucky, a lot of the airlines actually are below 17 inches on the 787. And when you do that, you can see again that we have the uh, advantage in terms of economic, not just a small advantage, a pretty large advantage because when we compete against the 787-9 we have almost 35 to 40 seats more on our aircraft an airplane that more, more or less does the same job and those 35 40 seats all generate additional revenue to the airline each seat generates is worth between two and three million dollars to an airline so when you have 30 40 seats more you can see very quickly what that does to an airline's profitability going forward the 787-10 was quickly designed to try and compete because they knew the dash 9 can't compete against the 35900 so they very quickly came up with the Dash 10. It's a sort of aeroplane where they just, you know, just stretched the aeroplane. They haven't done much more to it. So it's lost a lot of range. It suffers against range against the 350-900. This type of aircraft does need to go 12, 14 hour flights because it has to fly from Asia. It has to get to Europe. It has to go to Europe all the way to Los Angeles. It has to cross the Pacific. So if you don't have the range capability in this class of aeroplane, it makes a big difference. 350-1000 against the 777-9. As you see, we put just 10 abreast. If it was 9 abreast, the numbers would, be, would look ridiculous on the 777. So they had to make the airplane bigger, so they said, oh yes, the market needs a bigger airplane. But bigger, just in length, wasn't enough. They had to go to the 10 abreast, to the uncomfortable seating as well. So in all these parameters, whether it's comfort, whether it's efficiency, whether it's profitability, as you can see, going through the Airbus aircraft types, you can see that the advantage that we've created. So again, although the 350 has just gone into service, we're already innovating to see what else we can do to make the airplane even better for our customers and eventually for us as uh, the traveling public. So when we look at the galley, we've got the initial <coughs> feedback from the airlines, well, maybe we don't need such a big galley, we go to a small one. So we've played around with some galley ideas. 
and the airlines taking the aircraft from, I think it's 2017 onwards, will have this option to take the uh, slightly smaller galley, but again, incorporating the labs into the galley, which again, frees up space in the cabin, gives you more seats. We have smart labs, we have, we have smart galleys in our, in our A350s. But we've also started to create a family of airplanes. When we look at the 350-900, it's not just the 900 anymore. Some airlines say to us, well, you know what, we just need a regional airplane. And when you need a regional airplane, it's not that we build a different 350-900, we build the same aircraft, whether it's a regional, a regular, or a not for long range airplane. It's the same airplane, but in the regional airplane, we wind down the takeoff weight, we wind down the engine thrust. That gives you low, lower maintenance costs, it gives you lower uh, navigation and handling charges. And that aeroplane, if you don't need the 12, 14 hour missions, and you're only doing six hour missions, that aircraft then delivers a value proposition to the airlines. If you get bored flying the aircraft as a regional aeroplane and you want to move it or you want to sell it, you just call us up and you tell us, well, you want it back at 85,000 pounds at first, we want it back at 275,000 uh, 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 tons of takeoff weight, and it's just a paperwork change from one to the other. Then that leads us on to the ultra-long range airplane. And the ultra-long range airplane came about through an exercise with Singapore Airlines, where Singapore wanted to fly from Singapore to New York non-stop. We didn't have an aircraft at the time, but we had all the capability within the 350-900, as it was, to turn that 350-900 into a long-for-long range airplane. And we did that by pushing the takeoff weight up to 280 tons. We didn't need any more takeoff thrust. What we had was more than adequate. We increased the fuel volume. We didn't put a new fuel tank in. We simply used the volume of the fuel tank that hadn't uh, necessarily been used in the regular 900, but it was needed for the Dash 1000. So it's the same fuel tank, it's the same airplane, it's the same everything. It just, when you use the aircraft to its full capability, it has the ultra long range to do those very long 19 hour missions from Singapore to New York. And it does so, again, very efficiently against the 777-8, which was up against it in terms of the competition. We move then into the 1000. As John said, we might be looking to see what happens with the 1000, see whether we can make an ultra long range of the 1000, whether we make a, a bigger 1000. All that's something that we'll think about in the future. But for today, this family of airplanes is a very strong competitor against the equivalent airplanes from board. So, whole trajectory again, as I said, just gone into service. But by 2020, we'll have pushed the takeoff weight up to 280 tons. We've got more fuel efficiency out of the engines, we've put more aerodynamic improvements in the airplane, that gives us 500 miles more range, it gives us 2% fuel burn improvements, and we'll continue to innovate with the airplane because that's what our customers and what we want from the market. A380, we've all seen, we all love flying on the A380, where I sat last night for dinner, I had a person on my left saying that they flew in on the A380, and the poor person on the right saying, oh no, I have to come in on a 777. Um, <laughs> And, then, and she was very sad, I can't see where you are today, but she seemed very sad that she had to fly in on the 777. And it was noisy, and it was uncomfortable, and it was blah, 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 blah. And, it, and actually, you can, even, you can talk to anyone, you don't need to be an aviation expert. Once they've flown around a few airplanes, everyone loves flying the A380. And the reason they love flying on it is because of the comfort, because of the efficiency of the airplane. And here, we can all do the same thing on the 330s and 78s and first in business. But when you get to the A380, even the first in business, you can do many more things on the airplanes than the airlines can do on the 777s or even on the A350s. So the airlines can really brand the A380 in their first in business class products and of course deliver much more comfort, whether it's uh, 10 abreast or even if it's 11 abreast seating in the economy class of the A380. So it's all driven uh, for, for the airlines to create their brands and you can see that when you, when you go on their websites. They, their flagships have become the A380. They show the best seats, they show the best first class, they show the best business class, they show even the best premium economy seats on the A380, and that becomes the brand, the flagship, and everything else that the airline strives for uh, to, to gain more passengers. And they do that, and every airline CEO that we talk to that flies the A380 says, this airplane is just a magnet for passengers. And so going forward, uh, we'll see that even when we compete against the 777-9, Boeing can do anything they want to the 777, but when it comes to whether it's comfort or it comes to efficiency, the A380 will still remain superior in all those attributes going forward. Again, innovation is something that we don't stop. The A380, we continue to innovate on that aircraft. Going forward, we're looking now to see how we can put more seats onto the airplane. We don't have to stretch the airplane. There's a lot of space on that aircraft. Um, even if we go from 10 abreast on the main deck to 11 abreast, we're still an 18-inch seat. We can get an 18-inch seat to the customer's 11 abreast, drives more seats. 
We can, we, we've got a lot of experience now in terms of where the most efficient space to put the crew rest areas are, where, where to, how to handle the rear staircase, how to handle the forward staircase, how to move space around the cabin. If we could get nine seats on a little A320, imagine how many more seats we can get in A380 if we really put our minds to it and, and we put the best brains on there to try and find more seats in the airplane without compromising on the comfort. And we're doing that, we're delivering more value to the airlines and this is what will make the A380 much more important as we go forward. So ladies and gentlemen, we have a very, we have a fantastic family of airplanes, very competitive against our competition and uh, this will keep us in the lead for many years to come. Thank you.